We are strong. We build. Innovate. And open new frontiers. Mankind is under threat. Forces of chaos unleashed. Men of destiny step up. We harness riches and new powers. We look beyond the world we know. And together, rise again. Amidst the chaos of an unforgiving planet, most species will fail. But for one, all the pieces will fall into place. And a set of keys will unlock a path for mankind to triumph. This is our story. The story of all of us. Northern China, 1215 AD. Mongols are coming. 50,000 warriors. The world's greatest cavalry army. Their leader? Genghis Khan. One of the bloodiest warlords in human history. His target? Chengdu. Today's Beijing, China's capital city. Cities are key to the story of mankind. Centers of power, learning, and wealth. They need protecting. Chengdu has 18 miles of battlements, 40 feet high. It's still vulnerable to attack. Half a million people live in Chengdu. Now, a battle for the future of mankind between the city dweller and the nomad. Genghis Khan, son of a tribal chief. His father was murdered. He was sent into exile. If you survive a childhood like Chinggis Khan, you're going to have a chip on your shoulder. You're going to want to prove to everybody they were wrong. You're going to want to prove that you know what you're doing. You're going to want to prove that you're the baddest guy on the block. He escapes his captors, fights his way to the top, unites the Mongols. and begins a campaign of conquest that will change the world. The key to his success? The horse. Domesticated 5,000 years earlier in Central Asia, horses have expanded mankind's frontiers. The Mongols can cover up to 300 miles in a day. Using the horse for warfare unlocks a new key for mankind. If we go back to the Mongols fighting against the Chinese, what we see is the first trip point in a history that will eventually bring us to the tank. And that trip point is horses. Mongols start on horseback, age three. They learn to ride without using reins. Well, when they encountered humans on foot, to the Mongols, those humans were a lot like sheep. You could scare them, you could bully them, they'd run. They can shoot at full gallop. It's the first version of the Blitzkrieg. It is being able to ride into a place, do damage, and then disappear before anybody even knows what hit them. Mongol warriors have four horses each. 
They can eat and sleep on horseback. No army will travel so far and so fast until World War II. They would travel faster than the news of their arrival. Climate change is one of the keys to the human story and drives the Mongols to change the world. Ninety-three million miles from Earth, a surge in solar activity. Blasts of radiation scorch the planet. It's the beginning of three centuries of global warming. Climatic changes in the ancient world, in the pre-modern world, directly affected historical events. In Mongolia, drought turns pasture into desert. To survive, the Mongols sweep south towards China, the great power in Asia, home to the biggest cities in the world. China is the great prize. If you can conquer China, you conquer the land of infinite supplies. Grain, of silk, of tea. China is the richest prize that Mongols can possibly take. Approaching Chengdu, Genghis Khan issues an ultimatum. Surrender or die. Mongol cruelty is legend. Prisoners decapitated. Towers of human skulls. Children slaughtered. I imagine for someone sitting in a city, looking out over the wall, and seeing the massive Mongol horde is coming in your direction. You have to immediately question yourself as to why am I still in this city? I need to leave or I'm dead. Genghis Khan raped so many women that as many as one in 200 people alive today carry his genes. The greatest happiness is to gather into your bosom your enemy's wives and daughters. 60,000 women, it is said, prefer suicide to being raped by the Mongols. get the Mongols to the city gates, but no further. To take the city, they use Chinese engineers and force them to build battering rams. Prisoners of war attacking their own city. To defend themselves, Chengdu soldiers must kill their own people. If the gate breaks, the city falls. Mongols overrun Chengdu. 
massacre over 100,000 people, then torch the city. The Mongols were an unbelievably effective military force. If they had a target that they wanted to take, no one stood in their way. An eyewitness reports. The earth was greasy with human fat. In his lifetime, Genghis Khan is said to be responsible for the death of up to 40 million people, as many as Adolf Hitler. He conquers more land in 25 years than Rome did in 400. Four and a half million square miles. The largest empire so far in human history. And the key to its success, communication. Six hundred years before the Pony Express, the Mongols can send messages by horseback across an area twice the size of the United States. Every 30 miles, a relay post with 400 horses. Government messengers carrying an official medallion can claim food in a fresh mount, the world's first passport. As a result of Genghis Khan's conquests, for the first time in history, one can safely travel from one end of the world to the other end. Paper, printing, and gunpowder will head from east to west. All keys to the future of mankind. But at the same time, a killer is on the loose. That'll wipe out up to half of Europe's population. Mankind battles an enduring enemy. Disease. Isik Kul, the trading post, midway between Europe and Asia. Genghis Khan has been dead for more than a century, but his empire continues. Along its trade routes, a deadly traveler. Bacteria. For three and a half billion years, Virtually every corner of the Earth has been covered by these microorganisms. Our own bodies contain more bacterial cells than human cells. Most are harmless. Many are essential. But these have the power to kill. At Issy Cool, a pandemic begins. One of the first recorded victims, Cutluck. Married, Christian, doomed. His wife's folk remedies have no effect. Imagine your husband comes back from trading and he has these big blue blisters. He feels ill. Is it from the air? Is it from the water he drank? Is it some foreign animal inside of him? What's going on? You're completely confused. Bacteria rush through Cutluck's bloodstream. They outwit his immune system and spread relentlessly. Distorting and swelling his glands. erupts in giant, pus-filled sores. Buboes. 
bubonic plague, passed on by an almost invisible carrier. The flea, its staple diet is blood. When it bites, it vomits plague bacteria into the bloodstream. Cutlook's wife doesn't know it, but she too has been bitten. Within days, both of them will be dead. In 1337, four people die in Isik Kul. Two years later, there are 100 deaths. But this is just the beginning. Once they've spread, these infections don't stop. Improved transportation makes diseases almost impossible to control. The fleas that carry the plague hitch a lift from one of our closest companions, the black rat. Native to Asia, they spread to Europe with the Romans. From a pair of rats, 2,000 new offspring a year. And every rat can carry eight plague-infected fleas. Black rats infest the cargo that travels along the Mongol trade routes. Spreading out from Isik Kul, the plague sweeps east to China and west towards Europe. Kaffa on the Black Sea, a thriving port at the crossroads of east and west, controlled by Italian merchants. One man is credited with speeding the plague into Europe. A descendant of Genghis Khan, Janny Beck. He murdered his own brother to seize power. Now he wants to expand the Mongol Empire westwards. Kaffa stands in his way. But he has a terrible new weapon. The plague kills his soldiers faster than they can be replaced. Hey! But that Wait. gives Janny Bag an idea. Dead men become ammunition. Biological warfare wasn't entirely new. In the 6th century BC, both the Assyrians and the Greeks used to poison wells. But at Kaffa, the Mongols took it another stage. They launched it physically, like a chemical bomb. Biological weapons are so deadly They've been outlawed in 165 countries, including Russia and the United States. But it is thought more than enough remain to wipe out mankind at a stroke. No one has ever used biological weapons like Jenny Beck.
one chronicler writes, What seemed like mountains of dead were thrown into the city. The rotting corpses tainted the air. The stench was overwhelming. There can be no weapon that is as terrifying as what is unleashed with biological warfare. You cannot see germs. You cannot see disease. And nothing you can do can make you immune to it. The inhabitants of Kaffa try to outrun the plague and flee to Europe. They have no idea they're bringing the disease with them. The plague, en route to the world's most densely populated continent. Siena, Italy, 1348. A family locks itself in hoping to lock the disease out. The father writes an account, one of the only surviving records, as the invasion of Europe begins. It was a cruel and horrible thing. I don't know where to begin to tell of its brutal and pitiless ways. The battle for the survival of mankind has begun. Mankind faces a battle against extinction. Siena, Italy. Six months after the plague invades Europe, thousands are dead. Annulo di Turin. Local businessman, the town chronicler. He barricades his family inside their home. The killer outside must not come in. Anulo uses fire and smoke to ward off the plague. No one suspects it's carried by rats. You don't know what the real cause is. It could be in the air, it could be in the water. And so you, you have this sensation around you of something building up, but you don't know what it is. The plague takes 10 years to cross Asia, moving slowly from village to village. But Europe is the perfect breeding ground. Hundreds of cities, 80 million people living in close quarters. These cities had all the conditions to sustain plague, the filth, the squalor, the rodents that were just considered part of natural life at that point. And nobody considered that these rodents and their fleas could potentially be a problem. <laughs> And then you had this massive number of people all packed together in these small dwellings. And it was the exact sort of situation you would want if you were trying to cause a plague epidemic. The plague has entered Anulo's home, infecting his wife, Nicoluccia. If you've ever seen bubonic plague, it's very gross. A huge purple growth takes place, which creates psychological trauma, havoc, and incredible fear. Anulo tries anything, everything. Vomit regularly, especially at the first sign of any illness. Drink a glass of your own urine twice a day. 
Apply an ointment to the bubo made of honey, egg yolks, and scorpion oil to draw out the poison. Avoid sex and baths. Finally, the plague doctor. His hood filled with herbs for protection. His treatment, drain the disease out of the victim. Physicians would try any desperate measure that could work. Bloodletting was tried, leeches were used, but none seemed to work. In fact, the smartest thing a doctor could do is stay away from the patients, because inadvertently we were taking the bacteria from one patient to the next. All the while, the plague bacteria are mutating, finding new ways to reproduce and spread. They no longer need to be carried by fleas, they are airborne. The airborne plague is fundamentally different because it now can be transmitted uh, from human being to human being. The kill rate was 75%. Now, nearly 100. In six months, 31,000 people, 60% of Siena, wiped out. More than two out of every three persons you knew in Siena were gone. Families decimated, clans decimated. Everybody decimated. I, Agnolo de Toro, buried my children with my own hands. There was no one who wept for any death, for all awaited death. So many died that all believed it was the end of the world. Fear and panic sets in, and you're asking yourself, what's causing this? Uh, you know, did I do something wrong? Did I forget to go to church? And each symptom seems like the devil is doing it. The overwhelming theory was an avenging God. Somehow, this was the anger of God causing this disease. Now, disaster tests mankind's faith. Avignon, France. Home to Pope Clement VI. One of the most powerful men in the world, controlling vast armies, and enormous wealth. When plague hits Avignon, the people expected the Pope to come to their salvation, to go and intercede to God to stop the plague. But Clement VI can't stop the plague. It devastates Avignon, killing 1,300 people in a single day. Pope Clement buys a field and buries 11,000 people. But it is not enough. He tries a radical solution. He consecrates the River Rhone as a floating cemetery. Bodies floated down the Rhone River. People realized the Pope could do nothing for them. Either God wasn't listening, 
or worse. Fear and loss turn to rage. The mob wants someone to blame. All over Europe, the hunt is on for a scapegoat. Thirteen forty-nine. The plague rages across Europe. Mankind is at its weakest and most irrational, searching for someone to blame. Strasbourg, Germany. The plague hasn't hit here yet. But rumors spread faster than the disease itself of a diabolical plot. They say the Jews are poisoning the drinking water. This was the Middle Ages. This was before the scientific revolution and the scientific method. You had a world that was rife of superstition, anger, confusion, and unfortunately, that often bubbled off into prejudice. Ever since the 6th century BC, when their homeland was conquered, Jewish people have created thriving communities around the planet. Today, 26 countries have Jewish populations over 10,000. When fear grips mankind, minorities are an easy target. The authorities in Strasbourg try to protect them, posting guards in their streets. But isolation breeds content. takes the law into its own hands. February 14th, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Jews of Strasbourg are given a choice, convert or die. One thousand Jews are burned alive. But the massacre does nothing to save the city. Five months later, the plague arrives claiming another 16,000 victims. All over Europe, great cities lie deserted. An eyewitness reports. Shops are shut, people rare. A deep silence in almost every place. Consider what we were and what we've become. There was a crowd of us. Now we're alone. Mankind rendered powerless by tiny bacteria. Across Asia and Europe, the plague kills over 50 million people in 15 years. But isolation can protect us. The Atlantic Ocean has stopped the plague reaching the Americas. The key to mankind's future in the hands of visionary leaders. 200 years after Genghis Khan, a young Inca warrior prepares himself 
for battle. Hatch a cootie. Courageous, dynamic, inspired. A vision of the sun god drives him into a mighty battle that will create the empire of the Incas. Pachacuti had an enormous sense of himself. The name means world shaker. He gave himself the name of, you know, I am the conqueror of the world. The Americas are home to 90 million people living in total isolation from the rest of mankind. In this new world, there are no horses. They've been hunted to extinction. No iron tools. No wheeled vehicles. But the key to life in the Andes, high altitude agriculture. This is a mountainous people, a mountainous society. And so if you want to have available farmland, you have to build terraces along the mountain slopes. And when you go through the Andes today, you see the remains of terraces everywhere. Thousands of feet above sea level, they cultivate crops totally unknown to the rest of the world. Potatoes, tomatoes, corn, Sixty years later, the Spanish will bring these superfoods back to Europe. A key moment in shaping the diet of mankind. But the riches of their land make the Incas a target. To keep their territory, they need to defend it. Pachacuti will have to fight against a fearsome enemy. Led by a dead king. The story of mankind is shaped by men of destiny. Pachacuti, leader of the Incas. His enemy? The Chancas, bloodthirsty warriors. They use the bones of their enemies as trophies. Their goal? Crush Pachacuti. And capture the Inca captain, Cusco. Leading the Chancas into battle. Cuscavilca. Powerful, ruthless and dead. In life, he initiated the Chanka reign of terror. In death, he speaks through his priests. In the Andes, the ancestors are very much present in people's lives. And so important people are mummified. Long before the Egyptians, the people of South America preserved their dead. Children, adults, whole families. The oldest mummies have survived for 7,000 years. With Uzcavelka leading them, Chanka warriors feel invincible. They outnumber the Incas and take no prisoners. But Pachacuti has a plan. The goal was to try to capture the mummified body of your enemy. If you could topple Uscavilca, then victory was yours. He believes in something more powerful than Uscavilca. Inti, the sun god, the most important god in Inca mythology. The 
night before the battle, Inti comes to him in a dream and promises him a glorious victory. Pachacuti seizes the idea of portraying himself as the living sun, Inti himself, embodied by the power of the sun. Pachacuti's father has fled. His brother has fled. But he chooses to stay and lead the Incas into battle. You go about proving yourself to your men by setting the example and saying, you know what? I might die today, but that's okay, because I was born to do this. And I guarantee it, every true leader that's ever went into combat has felt that way. Pachacuti taunts the Chancas, stoking their anger. He holds his men back, maintains their discipline, until they unleash a volley of stones. Every time I went into combat, it had everything to do with the will to win. That's what wins battles. Pachacuti makes his move. Inca legend recalls his bravery. The young prince threw himself at the enemy. He was so agile and fast, he terrified Iskavilka's bodyguards. The Incas' victory over the Chancas was legendary. They never stopped talking about it. They never stopped celebrating it. Pachacuti will kickstart the biggest empire ever seen in the Americas. Most of modern-day Chile, Bolivia, and Peru united under Inca rule. And to link their territory, a network of trails stretching 25,000 miles over some of the steepest terrain on Earth. At the end of the trail, Machu Picchu, Pachacuti's palace in the clouds, unknown to the rest of mankind. But the isolation of the Americas is coming to an end. In Europe, survivors of the plague will rebuild, launch a new era of conquest and exploration. That'll lead to the discovery of the new world. Thirteen fifty two, the Sahara, the largest desert on the planet, a searing wilderness the size of the United States, the toughest challenge an explorer can face. Ibn Battuta. He left Morocco at age twenty one vowing never to travel the same road twice. He's explored over 40 countries, but this is his first time in the Sahara. We set off into a desert, totally devoid of settlements. There's no road, 
No track. Only sand. But at this time, the Sahara holds the key to mankind's survival. The plague rages through Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. It's killed up to a fifth of the world's population. In Damascus, Syria, Ibn Battuta records 2,400 deaths in a single day. But the Sahara is a barrier against the pandemic. With temperatures up to 135 degrees, the plague can't survive the heat of the desert. Few living things can. The Sahara is vast. It's the definition of, of a horrible place to be. There's no water. It's incredibly hot. Your eyes are playing tricks on you. Your mind starts playing tricks on you. It's an incredible ordeal. The body's cooling system shuts down. Heat stroke. Then you stop sweating because you have no ability to get rid of fluid to allow you to cool down. You stop thinking normally. And it's that erratic, bizarre behavior that ultimately leads to that. Ibn Battuta's life in the hands of his traveling companions, the Tuareg. Nomads from North Africa. They've lived in the Sahara for over a thousand years, trading something we take for granted today, but was once one of the most valuable commodities on the planet. Salt. Salt was everything. Salt was literally the difference between life and death. Before refrigeration, salt was the key to preserving food. It absorbs water and stops bacteria from growing. Salted food can last for a year without spoiling. Access to salt determined whether you were powerful or not. I can't send uh, an army across the water or great distances without provisions, and their provisions are going to go bad if they are not salted. The Tuareg have discovered a rich supply under their feet. Millions of years ago, the Sahara was a sea. As the water evaporated, it left behind huge salt deposits. Salt trade is the Tuareg's livelihood. They mine it at Tekhaza in the middle of the Sahara, then trek hundreds of miles south to the markets in the great cities of the Mali Empire. Jene, Gao, and Timbuktu. But it is a dangerous journey in a deadly landscape. The greatest fear of every traveler, a sandstorm. Whipped up in seconds by 70 mile per hour winds. When a sandstorm hits, it fills the air with sand, it fills your lungs, it fills your eyes and your nose. You can't see. This wind and this sand can strip the paint off a car. You have to get shelter or you die.
One of our party was lost in the desert. After that, I never went ahead or never lagged behind again. After two months in the Sahara, Ibn Battuta's camel train reaches its destination. The cities of Mali. Travelers have nothing to fear. They gave me gifts of food and treated me with the utmost generosity. May God reward them for their kindness. Tuareg merchants can now trade their precious cargo. In Mali, salt is so in demand, it's traded for gold. Today, most gold in the world has to be mined deep underground. In Mali, it flows out of the bedrock of the River Niger. At this time, as much as two-thirds of the world's known gold reserves are in West Africa. The key that turns Mali's rulers into some of the richest men in the world, and their cities into centers of learning. Timbuktu University, one of the oldest in the world. The first in sub-Saharan Africa, up to 25,000 people, a quarter of the population, students. Over 300,000 scrolls. One of the greatest libraries in the Islamic world. Scholars from lots and lots of places went there to study the scrolls. It was the World Wide Web. It was the place where information was held. This is Africa's golden age. In the south, great Zimbabwe, a gleaming city of stone legendary site of King Solomon's mines. In the highlands of Ethiopia, an ancient Christian empire claiming to descend from the Queen of Sheba. And on the east coast, Kilwa one of Africa's busiest ports. Ibn Battuta will return to Morocco and write the oldest surviving account of Timbuktu and the wealth of Africa. The Tuareg will carry their gold back across the Sahara. Its destination across the Mediterranean to Europe. African gold will be key to the greatest explosion of ideas the Western world has ever known. It'll make some men rich and others reckless. Venice, 117 mud islands joined together, become a thriving center of commerce. Silk from the Middle East, spices from India, and the key to its wealth, gold from Africa. A young Venetian, Pietro Venier, hoping to get rich, 
as a partner in a bank, the Priuli brothers. Seventy years earlier, the plague wiped out half the population of Venice. But in the story of mankind, disaster creates opportunity. Venice is the nursery of modern banking and finance. It is the cradle of capitalism. In the 15th and 16th centuries, it is the place to be. It's absolutely the place to be. In Venice, African gold is minted into ducats, an international currency. Merchants bank their ducats with men like Pietro Venier. Modern banking begins in Italy. At the benches, the banchi, where money changes hands. They would go to banks to borrow for personal loans, and they would go to banks to borrow for commercial loans. Many of the same reasons we go to banks today. But Venice is a magnet for the disadvantaged, lured by its wealth. Enrico, an unemployed migrant, hungry and tempted. Forty ducats, over two pounds of gold. Pietro Venier has no choice. He must catch him. When the trust in your banker disappears, the banker's future has disappeared. His word doesn't count for anything. His promises don't count. And if your promises don't count, you're out of business. The authorities hang Enrico. There's no mercy for thieves in Venice. It's men like Pietro Venier who will finance the Renaissance. The greatest flourishing of learning and culture mankind has ever known. After the devastation of the plague, a rebirth. We have works of art, works of architecture, palaces, schools, academies. All of the human arts flourish where banking flourishes. They were buying collections for themselves, but they were meant for eternity. 5,000 miles away, China is on the brink of its own rebirth. The key, a deadly new invention. For a century and a half, the Mongols have ruled China.
But the plague has killed millions, loosening their grip on power. Thirteen fifty six outside Nanjing. A gang of three plots a revolution. Their leader, Zhu Yuanzhang. Born dirt poor, orphaned by the plague. Zhu Yuanzhang was a peasant. He was an ordinary man, but he had extraordinary drive. His men call themselves the Red Turbans. Peasants turned rebels. People have nothing to eat. And when a rebel leader comes along and says, drive out the Mongols, there's universal enthusiasm. By his side, his young wife, Ma. Daughter of a warlord, partner in the revolution. Ma and Drew were a match made in heaven. And together, they were perfect partners in this rebellion. Third member of the gang, Xiao Yu. Master craftsman, weapons expert. Zhao Yu was not just a soldier, but also one of the great brains behind this operation. Mongol soldiers are trained to use a bow and arrow with deadly accuracy. Zhao's response, gunpowder. Invented 300 years earlier by Chinese monks looking for the elixir of life. It's a novelty used mostly in fireworks until its power is realized as an explosive. Zhao designs a weapon he calls human thunder. A small stone propelled by an explosive charge. A lethal combination. The future of warfare. Rewritten. Once the gun shows up on the battlefield, everything changes. Anyone who picks up a gun is instantly lethal. Jew is quick to see the potential. With these fire weapons, I will conquer the empire as easily as turning the palms of my hands upside down. Jew's confidence will soon be put to the test against the deadliest fighting force on the planet, the Mongols. Hundred and fifty years after Genghis Khan invades their homeland, Zhu Yuanzhang leads the Red Turbans at the city of Nanjing, a peasant army to drive the Mongols out of China. The key to their strategy? A weapon that will change mankind. The gun. But their guns are a crude design and can't be aimed properly. 
The problem of early firearms is having the pellets leave the gun and go in the direction you want them to. It's aim that matters. Gunmaker Xiao's solution? Quantity over quality. A hailstorm of bullets. To annihilate the enemy, you must wait until just the right moment. The fire must be intense. One firearm makes no difference, but a hundred firearms makes a big difference, and a thousand makes even more. It must have been incredibly confusing and incredibly frightening. It is a game changer. Old school defenses, old school technology is no longer effective against the gun. Shout's gun levels the battlefield and allows a band of rebels to take on the deadliest army in the world. We no longer use horses on the battlefield. We still use gunpowder. That is a lasting change to the battlefield that cannot be ignored. Over the next 12 years, the Chinese drive out the Mongols. Nanjing becomes capital of a free China. Zhu, a peasant orphaned by the plague, becomes the emperor of a new Chinese dynasty. And his wife, Ma, the Empress, the most powerful woman on the planet. When Zhu Yanzhang founds his dynasty, he calls it Ning, which means bright. The Mongols are darkness, and he is light. The Ming dynasty lasts for 300 years. Its rulers live in the Forbidden City, a vast palatial compound. No one can enter or leave without the emperor's permission. It takes up to a million workers, 14 years to build. On the borders of China, an even greater engineering project. The largest defensive structure in the world begun by China's first emperor, completed by the Ming. Over five and a half thousand miles long, 20,000 towers. The Great Wall of China. Now, a technology first developed in China will be perfected in Europe. It will change the world as dramatically as gunpowder. 1450, Mainz, Germany. Johannes Gutenberg. Goldsmith, entrepreneur, inventor of the printing press. It's still one of the greatest stories in the history of invention. You think about uh, the impact that had, it's really hard to underestimate. In 15th century Europe, books are only in reach of the clergy and the rich. Handwritten and labor intensive, it takes as long as three years to produce one copy of the Bible. It was like having this powerful force, knowledge, that's locked in these objects called books. And almost nobody has these things. The 
The Chinese invented woodblock printing 700 years earlier. But it was slow, complex work. People knew how to press blocks of wood, but his innovation was to turn it into an industrial process. Manufacture books. No one had ever done that before. A goldsmith by trade, he carves letters in metal that can be moved around and rearranged. An infinite variety of words and sentences. To print the text, a modified wine press. He's been working on his invention for over a decade, but now he has run out of money. He persuades a wealthy businessman to see the press in action and invest in it, if it really works. Once you lined up that type on that page, one person could print off a dozen pages or a thousand pages. It didn't matter. The information age begins here. Every page printed in the last 500 years owes a debt to Gutenberg's invention. With an investment of 800 guilders, the equivalent of over a million dollars, his printing press goes into production. He prints 180 copies of the Bible. Another six billion have been printed since. Books can now be produced 2,000 times faster than before. 20 million are printed in 50 years. As knowledge begins to spread, it becomes more within reach of ordinary people in ways we've never seen before in human history. All these parallels you hear to the internet, that's a very good analogy. Now, a book will inspire one man to strike out across the oceans and change the future of mankind. Fourteen seventy six, off the coast of Portugal, an Italian sailor, shipwrecked and left for dead by pirates. His name, Christopher Columbus. A dreamer who will unite a divided world. He believes he's been saved by God for a special purpose. In certain cases, an individual makes a huge, a huge impact. And Columbus is kind of a pure example of that. He settles in Lisbon, Portugal. Job for them. With the help of his brother Bartolomeu, he begins to pursue a dream. He was a, a guy who had this tremendous personal ambition. He really, really wanted to pull his family up from the muck and become an aristocrat, become a gentleman. His dream is inspired by a book written 200 years earlier 
but thanks to the printing press has become a bestseller. After the Bible, the most widely read book in Europe, The Wonders of the World by Marco Polo. The epic story of a Venetian merchant in his travels east, through the Holy Lands, Central Asia, and on to the exotic teeming cities of China. It is scarcely possible to set down in writing the magnificence of this province. Here they weave gold tissues, as well as every other kind of silk and cloth. The city contains merchants of great wealth and an incalculable number of people. Columbus was a classic example of someone who really was inspired by literature and dreamed big. He's possessed with this, you know, kind of desire to win the lottery of life. He wanted to be the next Marco Polo. Columbus's brother is a map maker. Together, they plot a revolutionary idea. To head east by traveling west. Not over land like Marco Polo, but by sea. What a great opportunity. What a wonderful thing to be part of. When I think of it for myself, it's like, woof, you get a little frisson. Map makers at the time know nothing about the Americas. To them, this double continent doesn't exist. They believe there's a vast, uncrossable ocean between Europe and Asia. Columbus thinks they're wrong, that the world is smaller than they realize. And it's quite easy to sail from Europe to China. When Columbus said, let's sail west, you know, <laughs> they, had, they had a picture of the Earth in their mind. They said, are you crazy? No. For almost a decade, Columbus tries to finance his crazy scheme. He's turned down by the rulers of Portugal, Venice, and Genoa. But the balance of power in Europe is changing. Jose! With the help of the gun. It hasn't stayed a Chinese secret. Almost as soon as the Chinese had invented the first proper gun, within 40 years, this had spread all the way to Europe. No invention had ever moved as fast in the entire history of the world. Fourteen eighty-six. Southern Spain. 130 years after the Red Turbans, another rebel army fights for independence. <laughs> Using the latest in gun technology, the Arquebus. Technology is always improving, but there's nothing like war to give an outsized advantage to whoever has that slight technological edge. The gun improves when it arrives in Europe by trial and error. They want to increase their range. So what are they going to do? They're going to increase the length of the barrel because they know a bigger powder charge will allow that ball to travel further in distance. They're going to tighten the tolerances to increase the accuracy of that ball. They're going to find a way so that it becomes a one-man weapon versus a two-man weapon. The real breakthrough came with a trigger mechanism. A lever that operated an arm that brought this burning match cord down into the priming. 
individual soldiers were now armed with something quite deadly, quite accurate, and extremely portable. What happens here in Spain will help propel Columbus to the new world. Elora, southern Spain, 1486. A Spanish army below the walls of an Islamic fortress. The front line in a religious war that will shape the future of mankind. For more than 700 years, Spain has been run by the Moors, Muslims from North Africa. They create their own cities with their own architecture, centers of learning, preserving the knowledge of the ancient world. But Spanish armies try to reclaim the country for Christianity. They force the Moors to retreat back to North Africa. All that remains is the Kingdom of Granada on the southern tip of Spain. Key to the conquest of Granada, the fortress of Alora. If the Spanish are to reclaim their country, they need to capture this Moorish stronghold. A Spanish captain, Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordoba. Young, ambitious, known in court as the Prince of Cavaliers. Cordoba will become one of Spain's greatest generals, a tactical genius and champion of the Arquebus. The gun is deadly, but only at close range. He needs his men to be nearer the enemy. For four days, stalemate. Now he leads a fresh assault. of the arquebus is the equivalent of a jet engine at takeoff. Manuel! 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 Soldiers deafen. But the Spanish regroup and fight on. The closer they get, the more effective their guns. The victory at Alora, a turning point in the reconquest of Spain. Over the next six years, city after city falls to the Spanish. January 2nd, 1492. A day that changes the destiny of mankind. Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella ride victorious into Granada. Gonzales de Cordoba helps negotiate the surrender of the Moors. A Spanish chronicler calls it the most blessed day there has ever been. 
In the crowd, one man senses an opportunity. Christopher Columbus. Everybody's walking around with their chests puffed out, looking for new things to do. Now that we have our own country back, we can start trading for luxury goods with the Chinese. And lo and behold, Columbus shows up. Spain is the new power in Europe. Ferdinand and Isabella will fund Columbus's dream. He'll sail under a Spanish flag. Contact between East and West once brought death and disease. But mankind has unlocked the keys to a new future, harnessing the power of gold, gunpowder, and the printed word. History is made by people with ideas and a spirit of adventure. People who see opportunity where others see danger. A new age is dawning that'll unite a divided world. The age of exploration.